Chapter Fourteen of the Millionaire Baby by Anna K. Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Millionaire Baby by Anna K. Green. Chapter Fourteen. Espionage. As I moved slowly away into the night, the question thus raised in my own mind assumed greater and more vital consequence: Was she a true woman, or what my fears had pictured her? the scheming, unprincipled abductor of Gwendolen Ocumpa. She looked true, sometimes acted so, but I had heard and seen what would arouse any man's suspicion. And though I was not in a position to say, Mrs. Carew, this was not your first visit to that scene of old tragedy. You have been there before, and with Gwendolen in your arms. I was morally certain that this was so, that Mrs. Ocumpaugh's most trusted friend was responsible for the disappearance of her child, and I was not quite sure that the child was not now under her very roof. It was very late by this time, but I meant, if possible, to settle some of these doubts before I left the neighborhood of the cottage. How? By getting a glimpse of Mrs. Carew with her mask off, in the company of the child, if I could compass it? If not, then entirely alone with her own thoughts, plans, and subtleties. It was an act more in line with my partner's talents than my own, but I could not afford to let this deter me. I had had my chance with her face to face. For many hours I had been in her company. I had seen her in her various stages of emotion, sometimes real, sometimes assumed, but at no moment had I been sure of her, "'possibly because at no moment had she been sure of me. "'In our first visit to the bungalow, in her own little library, "'during the reading of that engrossing tale, "'by which she had so evidently attempted to lull my suspicions "'awakened by her one irrepressible show of alarm "'on the scene of Gwendolen's disappearance, "'and afterwards when she saw that they might be so lulled but not dispelled, in the cellar, and above all, in that walled-off room where we had come across the signs of Gwendolen's presence, which even she could not disavow, she had felt my eyes upon her, and had made me conscious that she had so felt them. Now she must believe them removed, and if I could but gain the glimpse I speak of, I should see this woman as she was. I thought I could manage this. I had listened to the maid's steps as she returned up the stairs, and I believe I knew in what direction they had tended after she reached the floor above. I would just see if one of the windows on the south side was lighted, and if so, if it was in any way accessible. To make my way through the shrubbery, without rousing the attention of any one inside or out, required a circumspection that tried me greatly. But, by dint of strong self-control, I succeeded in getting to the vantage place I sought without attracting attention, or causing a single window to fly up. This reassured me, and, perceiving a square of light in the dark mass of wall before me, I peered amongst the trees overlooking this part of the building, for one I could climb without too much difficulty. The one which looked most feasible was a maple with low-growing branches, and, throwing off my coat, I was soon halfway to its top, and on a level, or nearly so, with the window on which I had fixed my eye. There were no curtains to this window, the house being half dismantled in anticipation of Mrs. Carew's departure, but it was still protected by a shade, and this was drawn down nearly to the ledge. But not quite. A narrow space intervened which, to an eye placed where mine was, offered a peephole of more or less satisfactory proportions, and this space I soon saw, widened perceptibly from time to time as the wind caught at the shade and blew it in. With utmost caution I shifted my position, till I could bring my eye fairly in line with the interior of this room, and finding that the glimpse given revealed little but a blue wall and some snowy linen, I waited for a breeze to blow that I might see more. It came speedily, and in a gust which lifted the shade and thus disclosed the whole inside of the room. It was an instantaneous glimpse, but in that moment the picture projected upon my eye satisfied me that, despite my doubts, 
despite my causes for suspicion. I had been doing this woman the greatest injustice in supposing that her relation to the child she had brought into her home were other than she had made out. She had come up as she had promised, and had seated herself on the bed with her face turned toward the window. I could thus catch its whole expression, an expression this time involuntary and natural as the feelings which prompted it. The child, with his newly obtained toy clutched in one hand, knelt on the coverlet with his head pressed against her breast, saying his prayers. I could hear his soft murmur, though I could not catch the words. But sweet as was the sight of his little white-clad form burying his head, with its mass of dusky curls, against the breast which he most confided, it was not this alone which gave to the moment its most sacred character. It was the rapturous look with which Mrs. Carew gazed down on his little head, the mother look, which admits of nothing false, and which, when once seen on a woman's face, whether she be mother in fact or mother only in heart, idealizes her in the mind forever. Eloquent with love and holy devotion, the scene flashed upon my eyes for only a moment and was gone. But that moment made its impression, and settled for good and all the question with which I had started upon this venture. She was the true woman, and I was the dreaming fool. As I realized this, I also realized that three days out of the seven were gone. End of chapter 14